praised for its gentle lifestyle, Thailand is the country of smiles, kindness, flavors, saffron-colored robes that mingle with modern high-rise buildings. Travelers are fascinated by Thailand's beauty and landscapes, its culture and spirituality. It is a hospital kingdom whose numerous facets will enchant the visitor. The remains of the former kingdom of Siam are endless and magnificent. The traveler should get ready for a colorful journey as soft as silk. With its spectacular economic growth rate, Thailand is one of Asia's newly industrialized countries. The capital, Bangkok, with a population of about 8 million, has many facets marked by a long and rich history. Recently, the Salam neighborhood and Siam Square have taken on impressive dimensions. These shopping malls and their sophisticated architecture compete in terms of giganticism. This impetus of modernity has not disrupted the essence of Thai life. The little stalls continue to serve food all day long, and the famous tuk-tuks, the scooter taxis, pursue their never-ending hustle. In the heart of Bangkok, the Wat Pho Temple, prior to being home to the largest collection of Buddhas in Thailand, was the country's oldest learning center. Four chetis honor the three first Chakri kings. There are also 91 smaller stupas on the site. The scripture hall of Wat Pho has a library with ancient Tripitaka, the holy teachings of Buddha. The reclining Buddha, over 46 meters long, almost feels crowded in this building. The statue was molded in plaster on a brick structure and plated with gold. The eyes and feet are inlaid with mother of pearl. The souls depict the 108 auspicious characteristics of the true Buddha. In the heart of Bangkok, one area was spared by the galloping development. Before the humidity heavily impregnates the atmosphere, agile silhouettes work out in the Lumpini Park. The younger ones do kung fu exercises, the Chinese martial art. Elsewhere, groups are organized based on their affinities to practice Tai Chi, often translated by boxing with the shadow. One truly has the feeling that the participants are fighting against a shadow. This martial art develops qualities such as balance, calm, and concentration. The Wat Pra Kao contains the Emerald Buddha. The building adjoins the former royal residence. The temple's compound is an architectural marvel. Whether it be the chetis, the shining roofs in orange and green shingles, the mosaic encrusted pillars, the marble pediments, or the magnificently decorated interior walls, they all exude a holy atmosphere. Since 1782, the year Bangkok became Thailand's capital, it has become a major pilgrimage site. The building housing the Buddha is sumptuously decorated, guarded by two mythological giants. Every element is finely chiseled. Only the Buddhist may enter the temple of the Emerald Buddha, whose height does not exceed 75 centimeters. It is Thailand's most venerated image of Buddha. The Grand Palace is the former royal residence. It has been impeccably preserved and is regularly used to welcome foreign dignitaries. 
More than 100 buildings represent 200 years of royalty and architectural innovations. One of the main thoroughfares of Bangkok is the Chao Phraya River, its tributaries and the canals, the klongs, that weave a vast network throughout the city. In these neighborhoods, the houses, shops and temples are all directed towards the river, as they were in ancient times, when the Thai considered themselves as the water's lords. This unique network in Asia is permanently crisscrossed by all sorts of boats, from the traditional Thai boats to the narrow long tail speedboats with powerful engines. These flat bottom boats sometimes go through the Klongs at great speed. There are several reasons why the houses on land or along the Klongs are almost always built on stilts. The water level may quickly rise because of the monsoon. The air flows under the houses when it is very hot and cools them down. And the rooms are less accessible to animals. In their boats, the vendors go from door to door throughout this city built on water. All the daily tasks can be accomplished by boat. For Westerners, the transition is not that obvious but a well-advised traveler will immediately detect the spicy odors of Chinese cooking that indicate the beginning of Chinatown, the Chinese district. The Chinese were the first in the capital's history to prefer solid homes built along the streets to houseboats. When the city started to expand, this neighborhood became very important economically and for its strategic location. Pak Klong, the wholesale flower market, is just as thrilling for the senses. The lotus flowers are the stars here, of course. The Thai use them to decorate their homes and for the rituals of prayers and offerings in the temples. The orchid is one of the symbols of the Kingdom of Thailand, the world's leading cut orchids exporter. They are a must in terms of interior decorating. Certain culinary traditions may surprise the visitor. On the street, one loves snacking at these little stalls on grilled giblets, fried frogs or cicadas, grasshoppers or silkworms. In the Wat Pho that houses the giant Buddha, certain walls show that King Rama III also built a national learning center for traditional Thai medicine with a department specializing in massages. To this day, all traditional Thai massage specialists train at Wat Pho, which is the leading center for this technique. Technological progress also brought about other developments. Today, complete care programs are offered. The atmosphere has become more sophisticated. Patients have access to compounds combining traditional medicine with high-class spa treatments.
The dome on top of State Tower reflects the economic boom of the past few years. From this cosmopolitan, surprising, and fashionable site, 260 meters above the ground, you can admire the entire city and appreciate its expansion. Once fresh air returns to the city, nightlife starts in small restaurants and open-air concerts. Located 80 kilometers from Bangkok, Ayutthaya was the capital of the Siam Kingdom from the 14th to the 18th century. During this period, the Thai Kingdom reached its peak in terms of geographic expansion throughout Laos, Cambodia, and present-day Burma. The entire historical park of Ayutthaya has been included in UNESCO's World Heritage List. Here, 33 Siam kings from different dynasties succeeded each other until the Burmese came to power. They then blundered the temples of their gold leaf and disfigured many statues. The Wat Pra Si Samphet was the largest temple of Ayutthaya built in the 14th century. The compound included a standing Buddha 16 meters high, covered with 250 kilos of gold which the Burmese conquerors melted. This row of three impressive chetis expressed the quintessence of Ayutthaya's style that became synonymous with Thai art. On the outskirts of the city, the Wat Yai Chao Mong Kol, a large reclining Buddha, is covered with a huge saffron-colored drape. According to tradition, it will bring luck to the person who donates it. The sacred is omnipresent throughout the country. The Thai honor and greatly respect any religious monument and observe on a daily basis the religious rituals. Here, prayers end by putting a little gold leaf on the statue. On the banks of the Mei Nam Chao, the ruins of the tower and the chetis of the Wat Chai Watsa Naram were restored and have recaptured the style and skillful geometry of that period. Going west, towards the province of Kanchanaburi, the last meanders of the Chao Praya Delta spread over the plain in salterns where the work is exhausting. The country is an important salt consumer, as well as a major exporter. In Thailand, according to the legend, combining rice and salt is a prerogative of the gods. The delta offers large spaces to the Chao Praya, which is a lot calmer and peaceful here than in the capital's labyrinth. Once again, the uproar reappears as soon as we near the floating market, where the tourist boats mingle with those of the fruit and vegetable vendors in a narrow channel. The Thai truly appreciates small fried bananas. There are roughly 20 varieties of them in Thailand. Some women protect themselves from the harsh sun with tanaka, a cream made with plants. Fruit are a genuine gift from nature. Westerners often discover some of them here and quickly learn to enjoy their taste.
The Wat Bang Kung Temple has an interesting feature. It is held up by a banyan tree whose roots have completely enveloped it. Over the centuries, they shaped an amazing shell that protects a statue of Buddha covered with small gold leaves. Thailand has many national parks to protect nature and the environment. The waterfalls of Sai Yak Park, even though they are not impressive during the dry season, enchant the children who come here to cool off and play on the rocks. The bridge on the River Kwai would not attract so many tourists if it had been built under less dramatic circumstances. The bridge spans the Kwai Noi River, renamed Kwai Yai, in the 1960s. The Japanese who occupied the country in 1942 had decided to link the Thai and Burmese railway lines to transport weapons and goods. Work conditions were dreadful, especially on the Hellfire Pass, where British, Australian, and other foreign war prisoners, as well as conscripted Asian laborers, dug out the rock with pathetic tools. Today, in this bamboo forest, one honors the memory of 90,000 men who died during the construction. Today, a calm atmosphere prevails on the river. It is the starting point for hiking expeditions into the neighboring plains and forests one can also simply relax and enjoy the appeasing landscape. Rice is one of Thailand's main crops. They are the world's leading exporters. Most specialists in Asia maintain that Thai rice is the best in the world. It is also a major ingredient in the kingdom's gastronomical culture. Growing rice is subjected to very special care. In Sufan Buri, the visitors gather at the entrance of the Wat Pai Lele. Whatever their social status or age, the Thai all share the same devoutness and assiduously observe the faith of Buddhism. In a country with almost 300,000 monks, religion is naturally part of the daily life. Sufenburi, known during the 13th century as Yu Thong, was influenced by different Mon, Khmer, and local styles. The result prefigured what Ayutthaya would look like a few years later. At the time, a major characteristic of the image of Buddha was lining the eyes and mouth like a fine mustache. This ancient home that belonged to a rich merchant with large rooms well protected from the sun was built in the typical architecture style of teak houses that prevailed during the Ayutthaya kingdom. Further along the river in Sam Shu, the elderly perpetuate traditions, especially drinking a sweet coffee made by using a skillful dosage and filtering technique. You may enjoy it on the terrace of cafes.
With more than 30 species, fish are abundant in the river. The Wat Tai Sung near Yutai Tani partially goes back to the Ayutthaya period. More contemporary elements were added over the years, but they're all finally ornate. Inside the temple, everything glistens and shines. It's the first image of Buddha. The monks here transmit a current of thought to the entire site, initiate disciples to meditation techniques, and decide on the overall layout of the compound. Still under construction, the classrooms and library will be just as beautiful. Every temple is financed by donations from worshippers. Around Yutai Tani, a wildlife reserve protects the treasures created by the Chao Praya River and its tributaries. Most of the villagers of Banya Tai Fo belong to Lao Krang, an ethnic minority that came from Laos 300 years ago. This ethnic group has always worked cotton and woven it by using traditional tools. In the village, the women spin cotton and wool according to the Lao Krang tradition. This activity allows the cooperative of Ban Na Ta Fu to pursue their ancestral activity. It is also a major source of income. They weave the cotton on looms that go way back in time then dye them with natural ingredients, like krong, a resin obtained from an insect that gives off a bright red color. These long shawls will be worn during religious festivities. The motives portray animals, flowers, or hunting weapons, confirming their deep commitment to nature. The lotus flower grows easily as long as its stem is in water. In the Thai culture, the lotus is an allegory, referring to the wise man's life. The roots grow in mud, while the white flowers bloom towards the sky. The rice fields also require a lot of humidity. The stems are permanently in water. Some regions obtain two to three harvests per year. Casanava is grown in the more arid plains. However, most of it destined to be exported. Protected by imposing cliffs in Lansac, a virgin forest shelters a palm tree that symbolizes the region and makes us go far back in time. The trees and plants have not changed for several centuries, renewed by an unchanging cycle. Only the caverns have been eroded and contribute to the site's atmosphere of another era. Pigeons and bats share these sites sheltered from civilization. Heading toward Yutai Tani on the Sakai Krong River, Everything is peaceful again. On the river, the fishermen live in houseboats around which some farm different species of fish in protected basins. This beautiful home with its truly typical Thai architecture belongs to a rich rice merchant. In the past, the holds of these large junks used to overflow with rice. Today, the few that remain are used to show tourists the secrets of the delta that has also become an amazing natural reserve. Kompeng Fet announces the proximity of Sukhothai, 
the former capital of the kingdom. The historical park is now a UNESCO World Heritage Site. Over the centuries, the Wat Prao Kao, adjoining the Grand Palace, has suffered from exposure to the elements and has given certain Buddha statues their unusually slender appearance. Sukhothai was the first capital of Siam. It reached its peak between the 13th and 14th century, a period considered as the golden age of Thai civilization. During those 200 years, the most famous king was Rama Kam Hain, who perfected the first Thai alphabet by modifying Sanskrit writing. His writings are said to mark the beginning of Thai literature. The Wat Mahathad is the largest temple in Sukhothai, with a main chedi. Centuries have gone by, yet the delicate architecture and the perspective of the various elements of the royal shrine create a peaceful atmosphere, an invitation to meditate, as the numerous representation of Buddha suggest. The various chedis confirm the influence of Khmer art before the Ceylonese art form reached this region. Set in an extraordinary natural setting, the Watsi Sawai and its three Khmer style pagodas were built in Hindu style architecture. Relics of a Hindu sculpture allowed archaeologists to identify the origin of the temple, which later became a Buddhist monastery. The place may be holy, however the park's moats are full of fish. To fish, they use the traditional net technique. We continue our journey north and arrive in Lampang. This ancient teak trading center holds one of the most beautiful temples of northern Thailand. The Lana style construction was built in wood. The Wat Pra Tat Lapang Lung was built by the king of Chiang Mai during the 15th century. It is believed to be the most ancient wooden construction of the country. The 45-meter-high chedi behind the temple was built in 1449. The most spectacular part is the central viharn held up by two rows of impressive teak pillars that are finely decorated. Frescoes from the early 19th century represent Jatakas, tales on the previous lives of Buddha. Roughly 95% of the population practices Theravada Buddhism. From a social point of view, it is each man's duty to spend a short period of his life as a monk, preferably when he has finished his studies. Today, at the Wat Sri Chom, an important ordination ceremony for novices is being held. Before turning 20, boys may become temporarily ordained, a prestige which many families seek. When a son takes the robe and the begging bowl, the merit derived from the ordination also accrues to the family. School is mandatory and free until the age of 13. After that, the families have to pay, so becoming a novice also allows young boys to continue their education. The elephant is the national symbol of Thailand. Two reasons explain its place in the nation's culture and collective imagination. First, it has always been the best beast of burden on farms in the jungle, for instance. And secondly, for the armies of Asia, elephant herds were the supreme weapon before the invention of tanks and other heavy weaponry. 
Presently in Thailand, wild elephants number less than 3,000, and there are approximately 2,300 domestic elephants. Since cutting trees in Thailand has been prohibited, many domestic elephants have been abandoned or mistreated by their owners. Elephants are taken care of in this center, to the great joy of these visitors for whom these pachyderms remain a fascinating spectacle. The elephants still perform demanding physical tasks, particularly in jungle, given the strength they can deploy with their trunk. In certain regions, the number of elephant births has gradually increased. However, specialists tend to prefer birth in captivity in order to protect the species. In the elephant hospital, the personnel endlessly complains about the physical abuse inflicted on the pachyderms by their soulless owners. This elephant is trying to save his foot after he was shot. The other stepped on a landmine and is learning how to get used to a new sense of balance. As we near Xiong Mai in the village of Lam Fun, this temple built during the 11th century has one of the eight most venerated chetis of Thailand. It had been abandoned until Kuba Siwachai, one of the most famous monks of the kingdom, decided to have it restored in the 1930s. We continue our journey to the north and arrive in Chiang Mai. The ancient secrets and legends of the city quickly give way to a very typical cosmopolitan and contemporary metropolis. At the same time, archaeologists have recently exhumed the Wina Kum Khan, the first known inhabitant of Chiang Mai dating back to the 11th century. Muay Thai or Thai boxing is very popular throughout the kingdom. It is a particularly violent martial art that is in contradiction with the extreme gentleness of the country. The rules are very simple. You can hit your opponent anywhere on the body. Several training centers such as this one welcome Westerners who are fascinated by the lyricism of the films Hollywood produced on the subject. But confronting realities requires unfailing morale and physical condition. The impassioned fights are held in packed venues knee or elbow blows are often decisive. At sunrise, the Thai rush to the market that overflows onto the sidewalks. They have errands to do, but also want to feed the monks who totally depend on the secular population. Offering food is one of the good deeds a worshiper must regularly accomplish. These charitable gestures will be taken into account for the person's next reincarnation. For the Thai New Year, religious dignitaries of the region and the most important members of the community gather for a common prayer. They then all head for the street where a long line of worshippers is waiting to participate in the morning's offerings.
As the monks go down the line, numerous assistants help them carry the offerings. Chiang Mai has more than 300 temples, but it is far from the city's agitation atop the mountain of Doi Sute, at about a thousand meters, that lies the true marvel of the Wat Prata. Founded in the 14th century of King Nun Naun, it is one of the most holy temples in northern Thailand. Like most temples in Thailand, they are regularly restored with the donations of visitors and worshippers. According to the legend, after wandering around on its own, an elephant carrying a holy relic climbed the mountain, walked in a circle three times, and then died here. The temple and the chedi inside the compound are a tribute to him. The gold-plated chedi is surrounded by a marble hallway in which visitors devoutly accomplish their circumambulations. Above the temple, as you climb higher and higher, the mountain slowly changes as conifer trees and very rare plants appear. The natural park tries to preserve the unoccupied parts of the mountain and its 300 bird species and over 2,000 species of ferns and flowers. Coffee plantations occupy the sunny plateaus. At 1,500 meters, we arrive in a Hmong village. The ethnic minorities that occupy the mountain regions in the north often have semi-nomadic roots. They originally came from China or Tibet. They survive on these lands with the help of humanitarian associations and the income they derive from weaving. As other tribes, the Hmongs are not regarded as Thai citizens and cannot benefit from any governmental aids or resources. Thailand is the world's leading exporter of cut orchids. Deforestation and the excessive picking of wild orchids almost caused several species to disappear. Since then, many farms have chosen to exclusively grow this beautiful flower that exists in a subtle range of numerous colors. Depending on the regions, the melodies of traditional music are more pastoral in the heart of Thailand and often simpler in the north. In Chiang Mai, handicrafts such as these hand-painted umbrellas still play an important role in the region's economy. To pay tribute to this very meticulous art, a fair, called the Bo Sang, is held once a year. It organizes exhibits and offers rewards for the best artisans. The expression of the dancer's hands has always fascinated the visitors. These gestures are called mudras. They are an extremely important explanation factor, as they allow the knowledgeable spectator to read a dance in a sort of language that was handed down over several generations.
Heading south toward the Gulf of Thailand, the landscape radically changes. Koh Samui is the third largest island of Thailand, a paradise for tourists with beautiful beaches of fine white sand. The first settlers of Samui arrived 150 years ago from the Chinese island of Hanan to take up coconut farming. The cultural difference between Samui and the other southern islands can probably be explained by the influence of the Chinese from Hainan. Once the monsoon has cooled off the atmosphere, it is time to go to the Bang Rak market. The coconut is omnipresent here, of course, but fruit and vegetables are sold in abundance. Today, Shaowang is one of the most visited sites of the island with a main street that bustles day and night. But Shaowang mainly owes its reputation to the long beaches that line several bays and its exceptional coral reefs. In these enchanting landscapes, the visitor has a hard time to choose a spot to cool off among the numerous sheltered little coves. Relaxation and spa centers nestle in this luxuriant setting. Called the Pearl of the South by the tourist industry, Phuket is about 50 kilometers long and Thailand's largest island. The beaches to the northwest have preserved their peacefulness and authenticity. Whereas on the beaches in the center of the island, large hotels have been rebuilt after the horrible tsunami in December 2004. Tremendous energy mobilized the population and within a few months, the region managed to attract tourists once again. The Thai love to spend time on the northern beaches of Mai Kao to eat fish that has just been unloaded from the returning fishing boats. There again, an entire population found the motivation to go back out to sea, regardless of the memory of what happened in 2004. With the help of international organizations, they were slowly able to rebuild their fishing fleet. On the other hand, Patong Beach seems to have never lost its vitality and fondness for partying. The old part of the city still displays examples of Sino-Portuguese architecture, characterized by two-story high trading houses where Maltese, Chinese, and Portuguese merchants did business with Indians and Arabs. A succession of fishing villages line the Pak Phra Strait that separates Phuket from the Phang Nga Peninsula. Fish and squid are dried in the sun. In a few weeks, they will be salted and eaten throughout the country. Women belonging to a Burmese community do the salting and conditioning, and the intense odors measure up to the extensive surfaces set aside for the drying. On the way to Phang Nang Bay, monkeys watch over the Wat Tham Suankuha, a temple nestled in a cave. In the Troglodyte Shrine, a large cave shelters a 15-meter reclining Buddha.
Mangrove forests border most of Fangyang Bay, in itself a natural reserve with its labyrinth of canals that only the fishermen know. In the mangroves, as on the rivers, fishermen live in boathouses. The water offers an abundance of fish and numerous species of frogs, as well as monitors that smartly hide behind the vegetation. These mangroves make up the largest virgin mangrove forest of the country. Near the ocean, time has carved limestone caves in the rock. Bats take off from some of these strangely shaped tunnels. Along the coastal road, the fishermen relax while participating in a bird song contest, which is very popular in the south. You have to determine which bird sings the longest during a given time. You may wonder how the judges are able to hear the songs among the noise of the street and the owner's encouragements. The stakes are very high. The winner gets a brand new scooter. The runner-up, a satellite television set. The shell of a coconut is used as a chronometer. When it is full and overflows, the round is over. <laughs> On the way to Krabi, the coast is lined with limestone cliffs, lacerated by the torrential rains of the monsoon. At the foot of the cliffs, the para rubber tree plantations whose precious sap is used to make rubber give way to palm tree forests. From the crabby beaches, one can reach several islands that used to be hideouts for Asian pirates. This region was heavily hit by the tsunami. It took a long time for the fishermen to go back out to sea or show the tourists the hidden treasures of their islands. These numerous islands are the result of a fault line on the continent that moved huge blocks of limestone and set them up in this geometrical pattern. They form steep cliffs that overlook the sea. When the tide is out, certain islands merely show a thin strip of sand, the ideal beach to enjoy the turquoise-colored water. The most famous island is the Kaoping Khan, also called the Leaning Island, or James Bond Island, after the famous 007 movie was shot here. Several islands seem to have been sculpted at the top and at the base, with caves that barely emerge on the water surface. The shape of Hong Island is certainly the most original, with several caves and tunnels that link up through the rock. Ko 
Ko Panyi is mainly inhabited by Muslim fishermen. They were called the gypsies of the sea. Most of the houses on the island are built on stilts. There is a mosque and a small school for children of the village. The Muslims are a small minority in Thailand, yet their numbers increase as we gradually approach the nearby Malaysian coasts. Thailand only gradually unveils its treasures. It still has so many places for us to discover and enchanting sweetness for us to share that one should already plan on going back there someday. <laughs>